quick LCTs. Okay, we're going to present today um, the talk Jailbreaking iOS and the Post Apocalyptic Age. Just for reference, the ages of jailbreaking are defined as this. Um, iOS 1 to 4 is the golden age where we had like lots of bootram bugs. iOS uh, 5 to 9 was the industrial age where the rise of the uh, user land came. And then starting from iOS 10, we have the post-apocalyptic age with lots of mitigation making our lives miserable. Um, <clears throat> jailbreaking, in a nutshell, consists of the following things. First, you somehow want to get um, a bug, you want to exploit the bug, you want to get an unstable kernel uh, read, kernel write, and something like that. In this um, presentation, we already start with a, an existing exploit. We will skip over all the exploits and just do post-exploitation. So what you want to do is you want to have a stable uh, kernel read and write. So we assume that the initial read-write we have is unstable. Uh, we want to make it available to other processes. We want to do privilege escalation. So usually we start with the sandbox process. So we want to escape the sandbox and become root. We want to bypass code signing enforcement, do system-wide code injection, because this is essentially what the tweaks are. And optionally, we also want to read-write to the root file system. So we will start here with getting a stable kernel read-write and making it persistent, because you would think it's trivial, but it's not anymore. So a bit of background. So the XNU kernel has this um, mark syscall, like the mark is its own subsystem, and it has this syscall task for PIT, which gives you a port task for an arbitrary port, uh, process, and if you own that um, task uh, port to that process, you essentially own the process because there are APIs available for reading memory, writing memory, controlling threads. So the PID0 on the system is the kernel itself, and if you get a, a task port to the kernel, you can use these APIs to read and write kernel memory, essentially. So for kernel read and write prior to iOS 8 or iPhone 6, what you would do is you would patch the kernel. Um, there's essentially check saying, uh, if you call this API task for PID0, it would say, hey, is it PID0? Um, don't allow it. So you would just patch the check, and then you can call the API. It would give you a port to the kernel. You can use APIs to read and write kernel memory uh, from user space. As easy as that. Starting from iOS 9 and the iPhone 5S hardware, Apple introduced kernel patch protection, also commonly called KPP, and that prevents from kernel being patched. So the kernel text and the const data segment is protected. So there is this KPP code which runs in EL3, which is at higher privilege level, and it repeatedly checks the kernel if it's modified, and if it detects the kernel being modified, it will panic. So we can no longer patch the kernel. But luckily, there has been a public KPP bypass um, dropped, and the kernel can be patched again, and it's like a fundamental issue, so we can try to work around, but it's like a fundamental thing, so, so it's gonna be hard to fix. So with that bypass, you can again do the same thing from earlier, patch the kernel code and knob that, and that works up to iOS 10 to 1 and the iPhone 6S. Starting with the iPhone 7, um, Apple stepped up its game again. They introduced KTRR, which stands for Kernel Text Read-Only Region. This is a hardware mitigation in the iPhone 7, which replaces the old-style KPP. Basically, it is a dedicated hardware memory controller, which locks down um, kernel memory, and if you try to write it, it will block this write at hardware level, so you can no longer write to the kernel area. And there is a second thing, which is um, you cannot execute code outside of that area, because only code inside that area will be executable. So more info on that on my other presentation, jailbreaking iOS, which is kind of now the part two. A uh, bit more of background. So Apple has this thing called host special ports. So basically the kernel provides special ports for uh, the user land. By, uh, basically the system daemon uh, launch D registers um, several things or itself. So an app can use these APIs to get the port to launch D, which is then used for um, IPC inter-process communication. And so there's like special predefined ports uh, which a process can grab 
So how do we use that for kernel read and write? Well, uh, on up to iOS 10.1 and iPhone 7, we can get the kernel task through the exploit, and instead of patching the kernel text, we will just write it to the data segment where the whole special ports are stored, and we use an unused slot, in this case port 4, and then userland code can call host get special port, which will again return a task code to the kernel, which is equivalent to task for pet 0, and then again we can use the APIs to read and write kernel memory. That worked up until iOS 10.3, where Apple introduced the pointer check. Basically, if you have this port, uh, you would call mark VM read, mark VM write, and several APIs. So these APIs introduce a pointer check, and if they check, okay, is the pass port the kernel port, and if yes, we just deny it, and we don't allow reading or writing. So getting the kernel task port now is kind of useless, because we can't use the APIs anymore. Right. Well, they didn't really think about how virtual memory works, because what you can do is, sure, the kernel operates a virtual memory, but if you remap that virtual memory to a different virtual memory address, both pointing to the uh, same physical memory, um, the pointer is a different value, so the simple pointer compare doesn't trigger anymore. So what we do is we, we get the task port, we remap it on a different virtual address and use that remap thing and that we put into host special port 4 and then if we call again host uh, get special port 4 we can again use get that task port and now this one we can use with the kernel uh, read and write APIs using MacVM read, MacVM write. So starting in iOS 13, the kernel allocations are split into different zones, and different allocation types go to their dedicated zone. And task structures need to be in a certain allocation zone, which are different than Mac VM APIs, so if you access something in the wrong zone, it causes a kernel panic. So what that means is that the simple remap technique does not work anymore. There are two bypasses for this in iOS 13. So Prior to 13.5, you could allocate kernel memory and copy the kernel task to the new page. And you can actually modify the zone type in for the page and set it to be a task page. Now, they fixed this in 13.6, but you can still like sort of use a different technique in 13.7, where you create a corpse task, assign the kernel map to the corpse, and you mark it as active. And then you map this fake task to host special port 4, and you can still use MacVM APIs for kernel read-write. So later, Apple introduced PAC, or pointer authentication codes, which is an ARM V8.3 hardware extension, which is similar to Max message authentication codes you may know from cryptography, but for pointers. What it does, it protects data in memory in relation to a context with a secret key. So these are the three main key points. So what you can protect here is return values, stack pointers, function pointers, V tables, and data pointers. You can also protect uh, structure context by hashing the individual values in the struct and then finally signing the, the hash um, with the pack. This is also what Apple does uh, in iOS. So context also contains um, a structure address and type info, so it's also a protection against type confusion sometimes. Starting in iOS 14, Apple has hardened packs, so it protects tasks, hosts, port structures, and it also prevents calling the remap function in kernel. This is called, and they added something called page protection layer, which protects writing to the kernel map. There are also pointer checks against the kernel map, and zone require has been extended to pmap. So how do we do kernel read write in iOS 14 and up to 15.1.1 and potentially even further? So basically, uh, I came up with this library, uh, which I call kernel uh, RW. So in order to initialize this, you need an early kernel read, which can be, which should be stable, because um, we need to read a couple of things. Uh, one 8-byte kernel write, which can be unstable, because we just need one single write. And then we need to need, uh, have an info leak of the current task structure. So basically what it does, it allocates two mark ports, one I call read port and one I call write port, and an IO surface object with a surface. So basically it retrieves the address of these ports through the initial info leak and the surface location in uh, surface client's array. So what it then does, we write, um, we use the write to replace the surface in the array 
with the address of read port IP context. And IP context is a field in the structure in kernel memory which we can set from user space. So for the K read, uh, we can do 32 bit read by setting the context, um, which we can set from user space to the port to whatever we want to read. And then we call IO connect call method eight on that surface to read four bytes. And this is equal to the method uh, get YCB CR metrics. So this is like some IO surface stuff. The write works similar. We set the context of read port to the address of write port, which we also leaked. So we set the context of write port to wherever we want to write in the kernel. And then we call a different method IO uh, connect call method 33 on that surface again to write eight bytes of kernel memory. Um, this technique requires a cleanup before the process exits because if you don't clean up, then the kernel will, will panic. But to restore that, you use a single 8 byte write in the client's array. You can use this very same write you have here to clean it up. If you want to hand over this kernel uh, read write primitive, uh, we also implemented a uh, handoff procedure. So we use mark ports uh, for inter process communication and then we use the available uh, primitive to retrieve kernel addresses and perform the initial write from the um, donor process and then from the target process they can, it's like armed and then they can use the read write. And we also transfer the original uh, address back so the target then can also clean up after itself. So this primitive needs to be passed around and on its own it's not persistent and it dies on process exits and you actually should be cleaning it up before the process exits. So the jailbreak eventually passes that primitive to um, a launch D and launch D holds onto the raw primitives and other processes can talk to launch D for kernel read write uh, via a library expose libkernel rw. Um, yeah, so for jailbreaking in a nutshell, um, we figured out the first thing which is get a stable kernel read write. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the privilege escalation, which is we want to get the ability to spawn processes, which we can't inside the sandbox, and we want to be root. So if you don't know how the XNU looks like, this is exactly how XNU is, uh, was designed. Uh, it consists of a BSD of mark part and IOKit part, which glues everything together so it just doesn't fall apart. Um, yeah. So first a little more of the background. So there is uh, this uh, BSD task proc, which is uh, each task has a BSD proc structure in the kernel, and proc structure manages resources and permissions of a process. So each proc structure has a UCRED structure. Now we wonder, okay, what is this UCRED structure? The UCRED structure um, handles process credentials and manages user accounts for processes and among others, it contains the user ID and the group ID, UID, AGID. And it has also a MACF label structure for AMFI and Sandbox. So what exactly is this MACF? This is Mandatory Access Control Framework, which was introduced in FreeBSD. It, hooks across, uh, it, are, it is hooks across the kernel, uh, which allow restricting permissions through um, these policies despite being root. So you can have a kernel system-wide policy, so not even root can do several things. And this is enforced by the kernel. So AMFI, which is Apple Mobile File Integrity, and Sandbox register MacF policy hooks. And we need to kind of work around them. So prior to iOS uh, 11, so including up to iOS 10, Sandbox and root, what you could do is set our own uh, prox ucred pointer and change it to be the kernel's ucred pointer. Um, Sandbox has a hard-coded check to not enforce anything on the kernel, so having kernel creds um, skips all the Sandbox and it already grants root permission. So having the kernel ucred, you're already root and you're already on Sandbox and you're done. So technically this works up to iOS 13, but it got crippled in iOS 11, because if you try that in iOS 11, and then replace the pointer and try calling some APIs, the kernel will panic by sandbox uh, text saying shenanigans. So need to kind of work around that. In iOS 13, they implemented some mitigations. 
However, we don't necessarily need the kernel UCRED, and we can just copy the CR label to escape sandbox. We're now on sandbox, but we still have our the mobile user. To get root, we can call set UID zero. However, it has a check if RUID, UID, or SVUID match. Patching the RUID would cause problems, even though it would immediately give us root, as UCREDs could be reused and this could elevate random processes on the system. However, we can patch SVUID to zero, and we can call set UID twice, first to update the UID and the second time to update EUID. And now we're root. In iOS 14, however, they implemented data pack, which protects a bunch of pointers and struct members with pack. CR label is now protected with pack. However, this contains a L pointer array with pointers to various mock F policies. The amphi policy is array zero and sandbox is the first policy. And iOS 14 does allow setting pack pointers to null. And setting this to null escape sandbox similar to iOS 13. Now, in iOS 15, they implemented some more data packs. So they protected just this pointer against nulling. Trust me, we checked. Like, they only protected two pointers for this. And the upper bits of a null pointer now require a pack signature. So iOS 15 sandbox bypass, um, coming soon. We have it working. Um, all right, that clears on the roadmap for the privilege escalation part, so we know how we can escape sandbox and how to become root. Next up is bypassing code signing enforcement, because otherwise we can only run Apple code sign code, and we don't want that. So up until the iPhone 6S, uh, we can simply patch the kernel. Like there, like even with the KPP bypass, in theory at least, we um, patch the kernel and we can make it treat every binary as being in trust cache, which is saying, hey, I am an Apple binary, I'm fine, I can run. Uh, there's minor differences in patching between before iOS 11 and later than iOS 12, but it's the same idea. Um, on iPhone 7, however, a KTRR prevents kernel from being patched and we need to figure out something else. So, yeah. So Amphi contains trust caches, static and dynamic, and the static trust caches are for binaries built into iOS. These are shipped with the IPSW and are for stock binaries. Dynamic trust caches are used for Xcode debug and they're for binaries that are required for debugging. Calling a kernel function allows loading new trust caches to mark a set of binaries as trusted. We use this on Electra and Chimera for iOS 11 and 12 for jailbreak bundle binaries. On iPhone XS and newer, this does require a pack bypass to call the functions, and it's only really usable for a limited number of trust caches, as we could run out of kernel memory. We have a theory for bypassing on iPhone 10 and lower, which you've not tested yet, but it should work. So you can load a large dynamic trust cache with some placeholder hashes, and have a daemon, like jailbreak D, to compute the hashes before each binary runs. If the hash is not in kernel memory, we can write it to the placeholder slots in the trust cache. Now, on the iPhone XS and up, we can apply a similar theory as it has load and unload trust cache functions. So we first load a dynamic trust cache with jailbreak-based binaries. And before each binary runs, jailbreak D can compute the hash. It loads a trust cache for the binary, and then it unloads a trust cache after it runs. And the code signature is now cached for future runs on the vNode. Now, this unload function might not exist on A11 or lower, but we've never really tested it because you can just write to the trust cache. Now, here's a bypass for iOS 11 and below. So Amphi calls MVD in user space for binaries not in trust cache as long as it contain any signature. MVD calls MIS validate code signature and copy info. We could load the daylib into MVD to patch this function to zero and compute a CD hash. The stylib can be loaded into trust cache, which you can write to kernel memory. MVD then returns that the binary is trusted and the binary runs. This technique has been deployed in mock portal, triple fetch, libre iOS, and Electra. However, in iOS 12, they added this thing called core trust. And Amphi calls core trust for binaries not in the trust cache before it even gets to AmphiD. So core trust relies, requires a valid signature that chains all the way back to Apple. AmphiD doesn't even get called if the core trust validation fails. 
And MVD verifies certificate expiry and provisioning profiles. Now, on the iPhone XS and up, page protection layer was a mitigation that was introduced, which protects certain data segments and page maps. And only the PPL text section of the kernel can write to these protected regions. And it must call the trampoline functions to change the CPU state to enter PPL. It's kind of like a microkernel with syscalls in EL1. Um, both of them are in EL1, but it's like a separate CPU state. And PAC prevents the attacker from calling said functions. PMAPCS is another part of PPL, which holds the trust cache and validated code signature blobs. There are distinguished trust levels. So TL1 is for app store binaries and sideloaded binaries. So anything allowed by MPD. TL2 and 3 are trust caches, so developer disk images and iOS built-in binaries. TL1 libraries cannot be loaded into higher trust binaries. So this kind of prevents third-party dialogs from loading into MPD. Now there's a thing called the code signing vnode cache. So when AMP gets called, it calls UBC CS blob add, which tries loading a, kernel, a code signature for a binary. The kernel maintains a cache of CS blobs for each vnode. So vnode is a representation of a file in the kernel. And the CS blob is the kernel representation of a code signature. AMP doesn't get called if a vnode already has a code signature attached. Now for iOS 12 and below, where we have KXEC, jailbreak D can get called before a binary runs. If the signature wasn't loaded, we write to its vnode cache, and we do this by replicating UBC CS blob add. So we patch the code signature to add arbitrary entitlements before running the binary, and we can call PPLs to register the code signature. This bypasses all of AMPHI, including core trust. And as for changing the code signature of system binaries, that changes its hash, which also demotes its trust level, so you can eject into it. This has been deployed in the Chimera jailbreak. Now, on iOS 14 and below, without KXEC, you can use a similar technique where jailbreak D gets called before the binary runs, and we can sign the binary with a free expired developer certificate. And the reason for this is that it changed back to Apple, so it passes core trust. In this process, we can also add arbitrary entitlements, and we then call this syscall to add a signature to the kernel. It loads the signature, passes core trust validation, and then if the MVD check passes, the signature is attached to vNode. MV does not get called again when the binary runs, as it is in cache. This has been deployed in Odyssey and Tarin. Now, MVD still needs to pass the check, so how do we do that? Remember that we can't load a dialog into MVD. So we use a different technique where we get the task part of MVD, which, as you saw earlier, allow, basically makes us own MVD. It can read and write to its memory. We register an exception port, so we're the debugger now. We corrupt a pointer for MS validate code signature and copy info. The next time MVD is called, it crashes. We catch the exception message and read the binary file link from the CPU registers. Then we can write the CD hash to the memory and continue program flow as a validation passed. Now, how do we get the task for it? To get the task for MV requires either the local process to have task for pid allow or the target process to have get task allow. Now, the UCRED CR label contains the MV slot with entitlements. And on iOS 13 and below, we can steal the entitlements of an arbitrary process. So for example, bin ps. In iOS 14, however, this label pointer is protected with pack. However, this pointer is an OS dictionary which is generated from the XML plist. Now, this is protected by pack, but it contains keys and values which are not protected by pack. And we can overwrite these keys and values in kernel memory to replace entitlements with ones we need from other processes. For example, we can still grab task for pid allow from bin ps, and we can still get the task part. However, we're still not done yet for iOS 14. So they added this thing called user land pack, and in iOS 14, they changed the pack keys to depend on the origin. For example, platform binaries have one set of keys, except for WebKit and iMessage Blast Store, or it's based off the team ID for third-party binaries that you load. 
And when you launch the jailbreak app, it is not initially a platform binary, so the pet keys don't match AMPVD. And we can't assign pointers to manipulate the process state since the pet key doesn't match. Now, Apple accidentally documented this for us. They put this on GitHub and then they pulled it later. Um, so as it says, the user space process keys are in the job field struct. And we can copy this from MPD in the kernel to overwrite our threads key. However, changing the pack keys of a running thread will cause it to crash if it calls any other C functions. The got pointers are assigned with the A key. So we do control what runs on our threads, so we can craft a signing oracle in assembly that doesn't rely on libc. And there is a signing oracle. Now, it turns out there was a mock API that could have done this a lot simpler. This was kind of like, I was more preoccupied with whether I could, I didn't think if I should do this. Um, but anyways, so now we can patch MPD up to iOS 14. In iOS 15, they added this thing called OS entitlements, where they switched from the XML dictionary to DER entitlements. DER is backed by a new OS entitlements object in the kernel, which is in the closed source AMPI text and is protected by PAC. So the way it works is they have a hash for the entire blob, so you can't really change anything in it. So iOS 15 AMPI bypass coming soon. Um, you can see we have SSH running here already. And that is bypassing code sign enforcement. All right, next up on the list is system-wide code injection. So why would you want system-wide code injection? Well, it allows users to install modifications, uh, tweaks to the system, gives uh, endless customization, plus custom icons, custom whatever. This is essentially what we jailbreak, right? So the requirements for system-wide code injection is to load custom code in the process on loading, must be able to modify text segment, loosen the sandbox restriction to uh, load assets and read preferences. So again, on iPhone before iPhone 6S, we can easily patch the kernel. So we patch out the sandbox Mac F hooks to not have the sandbox apply anymore, and we patch checks and VM faults to not invalidate the um, code, uh, the signed code pages. So the kernel still thinks the code pages are signed. How do you, how do demons get spawned on iOS? Well, LaunchD is the PID1. It is equivalent to initd or systemd on Unix systems. It calls POSIX spawn to execute demons. And even if on the home screen on Springboard you tap on an app, um, Springboard doesn't actually launch them, but it talks to LaunchD and LaunchD actually executes them similar to demons. So, um, for rolling custom code, you, um, so DYLD is the dynamic linker on iOS and macOS, and there are um, environment variables like DYLD insert libraries, and if that is set, DYLD will load the libraries on launch. It does require uh, the get task alone entitlement on the binary that we're running, but we can have that, uh, have a kernel patch which just sets that for all the binaries. So, we load the dialup into LaunchD using the taskboard that we already have. We hook POSIX spawn and add an environment variable to all the newly spawned processes. And the DYLD in the new process loads the requested binary, so we have system-wide code injection complete for the iPhone 6S. Very simple with kernel patches. On iPhone 7, where we have kernel code execution, we have to apply a different technique. So, First, we need to load a dialog into LaunchD, which we can do with the trust cache. We then use the task port to hook POSIX bond. However, the new process doesn't load due to the lack of code signing. So remember core trust, yeah, that's going to stop us here. Now, core trust, as you explained before, prevents loading binaries. However, our our jailbreak D can load code signatures, so we just add a call to load the code signature before the binary runs. And DLD in the new process then loads your requested library. Now what about the other processes? So other processes can call POSIX spawn, fork exec, system, etc. However, most of these just wrap around POSIX spawn or exec. Exec can be hooked and redirected to POSIX spawn with the set exec attribute. So this will make POSIX spawn behave a lot like exec. 
POSIX bond can now be hooked similar to LodgeD with another dialib, and the injection is system wide. However, code signing is still enforced, as so far all we've done is load custom code signatures. So we can't modify arbitrary process text, or can we? So debugging through Xcode does require modifying text to set breakpoints for LDB. This is guarded by get task allow, but we already have the entitlement. So why does a process still crash? Because a process must be marked as debugged. So there's a CS debug flag in the kernel, and we can just write that to kernel memory, and it marks it. So dialup is now loaded into all processes that call jailbreak D on launch. Jailbreak D adds the CS debug flag in kernel, and the process can now patch text. However, we still have an issue with sandbox, so tweaks still need to be able to read certain, app, certain directories from the app sandbox. Sandbox supports adding extensions via syscall if provided in an appropriate token. This token can be generated outside of sandbox by calling sandbox extension issue file, which can be passed by an environment variable to our injected daemon from launch D. The stylib then calls sandbox extension consume with our token, and this then grants additional directories. This is a supported API in iOS and macOS, so it's not a kernel vulnerability or anything. This is like a document API. So we add these steps to our dialib, and now we have um, system-wide code injection all the way up to iPhone 7 and the iPhone 10. So what about the iPhone XS and up without KXEC? So we try to load the dialib into LaunchD, but the dialib is not in trust cache. Oops. Um, now remember pack, which prevents calling kernel function, and the PPL also prevents TL1 binaries from injecting into TL2 or 3, and launchd is TL3. Remember how we patched AmpVD earlier, where we debug it? We pretty much do the same thing, but with POSIX spawn, and we load the code signatures. There are some pitfalls to this approach, however. Jailbreak D must be alive to debug launchd, and if jailbreak D crashes, that means launch D crashes. And if launch D crashes, that means a kernel panic. iOS also has this horrible habit of killing random non-launch D processes if the device is low on memory. So it's not as stable as loading a dialib into launch D. So can we load a dialib? We need to somehow demote launch D's trust level. But the trust level is behind PPL. So jailbreak D can demote the trust level of newly spawned binaries by modifying its signature, though we somehow need to respawn launch D. In iOS 9, Apple added this feature called user space reboots, which you can call on iOS 9 or on macOS by calling launch CTL reboot user space. However, this can run automatically overnight if the iOS device is low on RAM. This essentially stops all daemons, launch D then re itself, and the new launch D starts daemons again. So it can't inject dialibs into LaunchD as its trust level isn't demoted until user space reboot. And we can't debug LaunchD as all demons are dead during a user space reboot. Or can we? Now remember the code sign vnode cache, that as long as we have a code signature attached, it remains cached. So we cache the code signature of jailbreak binaries and LaunchD in the vnode by calling jailbreak D. We can then double fork in exec to spawn a second jailbreak D instance which is detached from launchd or initd, so it's not a daemon. We can temporarily debug launchd to then get things kickstarted. We politely ask launchd to user space reboot, which kills amphid and the first jailbreak D instance. However, the second detached instance is still alive and debugging launchd, and our code signatures are in the cache. So launchd then execs itself, and the detached jailbreak D can inject the environment variable into the new launchd. And the new launch D is now demoted with our dialib loaded. And the second instance can now exit. So now that launch D is demoted by user space reboot, we can load a dialib. However, jailbreak D is not running yet. That's an easy fix, however. We just have the dialib tell launch D to restart MVD, MVD debilitate, and jailbreak D. So, jail so code signing is killed again. So, as for modifying text in arbitrary process, we can reuse the same method from before, where we add CSDebug to the kernel. As you can see, there's no difference from earlier. 
To loosen sandbox restrictions, we essentially do the same thing as earlier. However, there's an elephant in the room coming up next slide. So this only works up to iOS 13 so far, as we forgot about kernel read write. As this primitive dies on process exit, and we just restarted LaunchD, and we didn't pass it to LaunchD yet. So the way we get around this is the jailbreak passes kernel read write to the detached jailbreak D instance on the double fork exec. And when the new launch D starts, the detached jailbreak D passes, jail, passes kernel read write to launch D, essentially like a hot potato. And this demoted launch D can still user space reboot. So how do we persist kernel read write? So after the first user space reboot, launch D holds on to kernel read write. MV debilitate and jailbreak D in daemon form can talk to launch D to do kernel read write. Launch D can call POSIX bond on the next user space reboot with the exec attribute. In this, on this hook, we can cause a, we can spawn a new temporarily detached launch jailbreak D again before launch D execs itself. And kernel read write can then be passed to the new launch D once it's relaunched. Okay. I think we can talk to our papers. So basically that uh, sums up the jailbreak in a nutshell. So we have optionally um, remount or read and write to the root file system. But I think we're out of time. Or do we have a couple like five to ten minutes? Is it okay? Okay, so I guess we have some bonus slides. Well, so read and write to the root file system before iOS uh, 14. So iOS ships with a read-only root file system. Um, prior to iOS 7, you could simply remount it uh, in read and write, and that's it, be done with it. But um, starting with iOS 7 and macOS 10.15 and higher, uh, they use a read-only root system, and that is also enforced in uh, the kernel. Um, Jamrick used to provide a read-write um, root file system for users and tweaks and files to place on. So how do we deal with that um, with up to iOS 11.2? Well, with the iPhone 6S, this is where we still can patch the kernel. So if we patch the kernel, we just patch the mount function, and then we still allow it to remount as read-write. Uh, for new devices, we can no longer patch the kernel. What we can do is, so basically mount has a check to prevent remounting the root file system. So if the thing that we mount has this flag rootfs, uh, or MNT root of S flag in the kernel, it says, okay, no, you cannot remount. What we can do in the data structure of that node, we can unset the flag, call mount on it, and then just reset the flag back into the kernel. And then at the time where we call mount, um, it's not actually the root file system. So we bypass that check. In iOS 11.3, they added APFS snapshots, where the root file system is now mounted from a snapshot. Under the hood, snapshots are used uh, in time machine backups, and they're inher inherently unmodifiable. We need to mount the live file system, however, not the snapshot. Up to the iPhone 7 on iOS 11, we find the vnode for the raw disk. We then follow the pointers, like root vnode mount and then the, um, the vnode pointer, and we unset the flag that specifies that it's in use or mounted already. We can temporarily mount the live file system to another directory, rename the root FS, and reboot. On the subsequent reboot, the live file system then gets mounted as read-only. Now that the live file system is mounted, we can reapply the same technique from earlier where we unset the root FS flag. In iOS 12, however, they set a flag on the snapshot in kernel memory, so we can't just rename it anymore. Or can we? So remember how we mounted the livefs to another directory? We get the vnode of the temporary directory, and the snapshot vnode is on the cache vnode list for the new mount. This flag lives on the vnode's vdata, which is the file system specific data. We can simply unset the flag, rename the root file system, and reboot. On the subsequent reboot, the live file system then gets mounted again. So this technique works up to iOS 14. However, in iOS 15, they added a, sealed, a sealed snapshot, where the APFS file snapshot is sealed, and like it was in Big Sur. Uh, 
I was 15 ensures that the LiveFS is never mounted, so we can rename the snapshot by the device will boot loop. Unfortunately, the jailbreak app runs a little too late to deal with this, so we might have to live without the read-write real file system. However, we can simply place our files elsewhere, such as the data volume. And that's our bonus slides. So at this point, congrats, you're now jailbroken. You can untar your bootstrap with useful binaries. On iOS 14 and lower, this can go to the root file system. On iOS 15, this can go to somewhere else. And you can call launch services to spawn an SSH server or to register a new app, and your device is now jailbroken. Do this. Oh, we can just skip this. Yep. I was 15 ETA son, so there's tweaks. <laughs> Hello. So do we have any questions? Where to start? Oh, let's, let's leave that slide. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the question is that all of this is very good, but a lot of things just was the over the head, being honest. <laughs> but if somebody wants to start in the IO security and wants to delve into this research field, how can and where the person can start? What resources or things, you know, he can leverage? So I guess it depends on what you want to do. If you want to do like vulnerability research, I think you can still do that. Like find bugs, exploit bugs. Sure, there's a lot of um, mitigations and things you need to work around. If you want to work on jailbreak, I guess you're too late. So there's too much going on. It's, it's going to be hard. Okay. But Trust me, I'm dreading the iOS 15 slides that we're going to have to make for next time. <laughs> okay. Oh, Any more questions? Thanks for the talk. Uh, I see that at previous slide you wanted to say something about the future. Could you elaborate on that? Ah, it is current. So, uh, what do you think about the future of jailbreaks? Uh, will they be possible or one day it will stop? Because of I mitigations? mean, it's hard to say. Like, it gets harder and harder. And as you see, all the things uh, that we can earlier, we can patch the kernel and be done with it. And now we actually need to play by the rules and work around over every single um, mitigation. And there's just more and more coming. Of course, it will be easy to say, sure, we can always find a way around or at some point it's going to stop. But the truth is, you never know, right? Maybe somebody comes up with a really clever mitigation, but then somebody finds a bypass or doesn't. You don't really know. And, and uh, you, uh, for the jailbreak, as I understand, you always need arbitrary read write, so like data-only attack right now to, to be able to bypass all the mitigations. Uh, and change the image, right? So for jailbreaking, what you want to do is you want to load tweaks. You want to customize your device. You want to load your own code into user process. And this is like the problem. We started like oh, probably eight months ago or even earlier with a kernel read-write and we already had kernel read-write. And that does not help us much um, to get to modify uh, user space code, then this is where all the tricky things come in. Because if you just want to, like, I don't know, steal some data or just modify kernel, whatever, the data thing you can do. But if you want to do the jailbreaking for these kind of things, this is becoming increasingly harder. Is there anything stronger than arbitrary read write that could help you? Can you imagine some, some exploit primitive that can help you better than arbitrary read-write? Yes. Um, if we have a pack bypass, for example, then you can arbitrarily call functions in the kernel. Or if you have a PPL bypass, at that point you can just overwrite whatever Apple marks as read-only in data. Or having uh, Apple's private keys to sign your code would help. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, there was a research about... Um, some 
side channel attack leaking the pack signature or something like that. Was it? So, um, I, I guess maybe we can chat afterwards. Oh, okay, okay. So maybe side channels will help somehow. I feel like a side channel might have scaling issues that you might not be able to deploy. So it might work for one device, but it's not going to be something you can distribute. Yeah, it should be very, very stable, right? Thanks. Thanks very lot. More questions? We have a lot, lot of questions. Well, that's a lot of questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very good presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, uh, in these Samsung or the Linux kernels, we have the hyper uh, hypervisor-based... Uh, you know, security mitigations, like in the NOX, you can see the Samsung NOX. So is there anything like that in the iOS or in the future if uh, anything like that will come? Uh, there was a thing in the past for iOS. Um, if I go back, um, KPP was originally implemented as a hypervisor in a higher trust level. However, that has time of check, time of use issues, so it doesn't really work that well. And Apple has, as a result, started moving stuff into the silicon, as you can see with KTR and PAC and PPL. They didn't go with it, right? Uh, later on, they didn't develop it. The hypervisor part of the mitigations, right? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So they didn't uh, actually go with it, the hypervisor-based uh, security mitigations, right? They just dropped it? No, they are not using the hypervisor anymore yeah, because yeah. it was inherently flawed. So they yeah. started baking the mitigations into their silicon. Sure, yeah. Thank you. More questions? Anyone? Last call. Right. If there's okay. no more questions, then thanks again. Thanks to you, ma'am. <laughs>